Hello, everyone. Um, allow me to welcome all our guests, virtual and in person, for joining us today in celebrating woman life freedom. Uh, my name is Saye Meisami, and I'm an associate professor of philosophy at the University of Dayton. Uh, I would like to thank the Department of Philosophy, the International Studies Program, and the Human Rights Center for sponsoring this event, especially the human rights team who has done all the logistics and hosted us in their beautiful space. I am also super thankful to our panelists who accepted my invitation despite their busy schedules in March. And I would like to offer my most sincere condolences on behalf of my colleagues and students at the University of Dayton to all our Turkish and Syrian attendees for the loss of many precious lives during the recent tragic earthquake. The speakers have joined us today in the first week of the Women's History Month to expand our knowledge about different aspects and possibilities of the woman life freedom movement. Despite its longer history, this movement became popular after the murder of Mahsa Amini by the so-called morality police in the Islamic Republic of Iran that was followed by protests in Iran and beyond, resulting in more killings and persecutions. But woman life freedom has a longer and wider history. It is multi-contextual, multicultural, and multi-layered. Thanks to its organic power and diverse history, woman life freedom has turned into a magical gate through which freedom seekers from different parts of the world have come together, different parts of the world have come together to advocate for freedom. This is one of those moments in the history of humankind when the fakeness of man-made boundaries is exposed. To pay our tribute to the feminist core of the movement and, the, and women's leadership, we have organized all female panels. Depending on their area of scholarship and or activism, our esteemed panelists approach the movement from a particular perspective. One of the main questions that we may all have in mind is the relation between woman, life, and freedom. They cannot have been joined accidentally. On the same note, why is it that the same oppressive forces which deny women their basic human rights also say no to life by genocide, ethnic cleansing, torturing, and executing, not to mention a brutal treatment of the environment, misusing natural resources, and polluting the fundamental sources of life? What makes dictatorial regimes and fundamentalist groups so fearful of women in the first place? And last but not least, what hopes can we have for the continuation and future of this movement to generate a culture of equity, empathy, and care for nature to benefit all peoples regardless of their histories and genders? I stop here so we can listen to our first two panelists who are going to discuss woman life freedom in, their, in, in its socio-political and historical context. We can all engage with them with our comments and questions after each presentation. In the first panel, each speaker has about 30 minutes followed by 15 minutes for Q&A. Uh, I invite the Zoom audience to type their questions in the chat box so we can keep track of them. Uh, and uh, for the in-person audience, you can just raise your hands and ask for the microphone and it will go to you. So in the first panel, we have the pleasure of hearing Drs. Shahzad Mujab and Islam Gunner. Our first speaker, Dr. Mujab, uh, is talking about rethinking revolution with woman life freedom. Dr. Mujab, scholar, teacher, and activist, is internationally known for her work on the impact of war, displacement, and violence on women's work, learning, and education. She is professor of adult education and community development and women and gender studies at the University of Toronto and the former director of women and gender studies at the same university. She is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Canadian Association of Studies in Adult Education Lifetime Achievement Award, the Royal Society of Canada Award in Gender Studies, and the Distinguished Contribution to Graduate Teaching Award. 
her research and teaching focus on the theorization of Marxism and feminism, intersectionality, capitalist, imperialist, patriarchy, and the revolts of women, the students and nationalities in the Middle East and North Africa. She has published extensively on these topics and they have been translated into Arabic, Persian, Kurdish, French, Swedish, and German. Welcome Dr. Mojab. We are ready for your talk, you're all ears. Hello, everybody, and, and, and thank you so much, uh, uh, Saya, for organizing this event and, and also the Human Rights Center. I'm very grateful to be here and, and, and to be uh, with my colleagues and, and, and panelists here. Um, I also express uh, my condolences, but also rage in, in terms of, of, of the response of, of the uh, Turkish government to the disaster of, of earthquake, which is not only the sort of a natural disaster, it's also a political disaster that it is happening. And um, also in advance, I apologize because I have to log off before four o'clock in, in order to catch a train to Montreal for a series of, of, of conversations around the same topic. So thank you everybody for, for being here. Uh, living revolution, uh, learning revolution, and rethinking revolution has been my lifelong intellectual and, and, and political pursuit. I do use the cherished concept of a revolution as a dream, as a political act, as a poetic expression, and as the right of all to revolt against injustices. I do not intend in, in this short talk to attend to the feminist theoretical contestation of the notion of revolution. Rather, I will use it as a historical framework to discuss the last few months where a revolutionary storm was sparked by the fall of a butterfly, Gina Mahsa Amini. Just a quick word on this historical framing. The contemporary genealogy of it is it started with the 2009 Green Movement in Iran, 2011 Ara Arab Revolt and the rise of Rojava in the northern Syria, the Kurdish region of the northern Syria. 2018 Sudanese Revolution, the 2019 uh, uh, till 21 Al Algerian protests also so-called the revolution of smiles, to, and, and then 2022, Gina's revolution in Iran, and certainly the ongoing intifada in, in Palestine. The region, as a lot of, of, of you are, are fully aware, is sweltering with poverty, violence, rage, anger, and revolt. And by region, I mean the entire Middle East and North Africa. And women and youth are leading these uprisings. Authoritarian, corrupt, and militarized patriarchal regimes, both secular and theocratic, are colluding with the capitalist imperialist powers of the West to sustain themselves and with them, the West too. And then here by sustaining themselves, I mean these regimes in the region. Stunned with fear and hope has been my mode of emotional being and thinking since September 2022. Stubbornly hope remains the only option, though fear of intensified state violence the, um, of, of the uh, Islamic regime, including executions, arrests, and, and torture. And then in recent uh, uh, weeks, um, this chemical poisoning of high school students as a revenge, which I will come back to it later. So all of this, this hope, this is stubborn hope is, is persistently present in, in my mode of, of, of thinking and, and being. The presence of the absence of a clear future path to enable women life freedom is distressing the contradiction of fear and hope unsettles me. Only I wait, I wait there to be settled in my revolutionary dreams. 
So bear with me as I will step into the past to arrive in present and try to unravel these contradictions to comprehend the current revolutionary situation in Iran. Summer of, of 1983 is the one that I still feel intensely. I vividly remember the moment when I heard, be happy, shouted a young bony looking Baluch man. You're safe now, you're free. And he continued, we passed the Iranian border. Deep sadness settled in my body. My stomach clenched to calm, to calm my husband and my crying one-year-old son. I swallowed my tears and faked the joy of freedom. I was forced to leave home to gain another in exile. The Islamic forces began a massive and systematic suppression of dissidents, women, national minorities, the left, secular liberals, writers, students, workers, and intellectuals soon after they came to power. And the use of violent force was the means to consolidate their, their power. So as you can see, my life is interlocked with the 1979 revolution of Iran. Above all, I'm still a living witness to the rise and fall of the last populist democratic revolution of the 20th century, a revolution that has been written about extensively, though its history remains to be retold, especially by the rebellious Kurdish women and the left. I belong to the generation of women targeted by both the secular and theocratic regimes. Our bodies were inscribed, tested, dressed, undressed, shaped, and reshaped as part of, of, of the projects of, of the nation state building. In my teens, I was modernized, quote unquote, educated and taught ideas of independence as an urban middle class uh, belonging to the dominant nation of Persian. Soon after finishing my college education in the 70s, I was sent to the US on a government scholarship to become a technocrat and learn to redesign the Iranian university structure um, uh, sort of, of modeled after the American system of, of university governance. However, it was the ongoing era of, of the 1960s the student movements, especially the anti-war, civil rights and feminist activism on the campuses of, of, of universities in the US and my campus, University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, which excited me and animated my life. In these movements, I discovered myself, my country, the whole world, my passion, my future. I rebelled against myself and relations around me. I became a revolutionary, a feminist revolutionary, intensely in love with humanity. The rise of revolutionary tide, tides pulled me back to Iran. Like thousands of other Iranian students abroad, I returned home to join in rebuilding post-monarchical Iran into a democratic society, as vague as it sounds now and more than 40 years ago. The dream days were cut short, too short indeed for me to even have a chance to blink at any particular moment of it. For 40 years, I have carried the heavy burden of the unfulfilled dream of freedom, justice, and the lifting of the tyranny of the state off the back of people. In my resettling and rerouting struggle in exile, even as an intellectual, I have been discreet about the pain and the joy of this unsettling years of resistance. I don't know how to express it fully. Maybe it is the anger of a revolution stolen from people. The controlling, disciplining, and punishing women's bodies and sexualities. The suppression of thought and ideas. Or maybe it is because of, of the day that I took my parents' wedding photo to, a, uh, to be framed in, in Toronto. This photo was taken in, in 1953. 
the young woman in the store said, oh, how pretty, is this you? My parents, I replied, the smile disappeared and the frown of curiosity covered her face. Hmm, they look very modern. I felt drained, tired of, of giving history lessons and narrating the story of a coup staged by the CIA, MIK, UK-based uh, um, group collaborations in, in depriving a nation of their democratic ambitions in 1953 and then in 1979, the democratic ambition of a nation being appropriated by the Islamist forces with the intervention of the imperialist powers. Hence, I never use this, the so-called Islamic revolution. It was not an Islamic revolution. It was a democratic revolution of 1979. It was taken over, hijacked by the Islamist forces that constituted the Islamic Republic of Iran. So going back to what I started at the beginning, a revolutionary storm sparked by the fall, by the fall of a butterfly. Let me repeat these headlines. You've heard it 100 times by now, but it is important for me to re-repeat re it here. Jina Mahsa Amini, a 22-year-old Kurdish woman of Iran, was arrested for improper veiling by the morality police and was brutally killed while in custody on September 16, 2022. The reason that I'm repeating this, this news, this headline news, because it contains three significant elements of the Islamic State violent oppression, gender around the notion of, of the compulsory veiling, suppression of, of national minorities, the Kurds, and then also the state machinery of violence around the notion of morality police. Gina was not the first woman to face the brutality of, of the Islamic State. Millions of women, you're hearing me correctly, millions of women and men have faced the violence of a state repeatedly and continuously over the last four decades. Let me give you a, a, a number that was released by the interior minister in 2014, when it says that in this report, 220,000 women were taken to police stations to sign a statement that they will not violate the compulsory veiling law. In the same year, close to 4 million women and men received warnings and quote unquote guidance because they failed to follow the Islamic dress code or defy publicly regulated morality code ranging from men's hairstyle to tight pants, to women's makeups and bodily posture, even um, loud laughters in, in public. And then also especially those who appear to be transgender or members of, of the LGBTQ communities. Gina was not the first Kurdish woman to face the brutality of, of the Islamic State. The Islamic theocracy is like the Pahlavi monarchy that was in power from 1926 to 1979, a unitary state rooted in, in Persian national superiority in terms of the language, even Shia sect of Islam and an culture, and rejects the idea of self-rule or autonomy for national minorities. Jina's name is parenthesized as is argued by several Kurdish feminist scholars, including my dear colleague, Islam Gunnar, who is here, that the erasure of Gina's Kurdish name and identity and dismissing the likely relationship of her Kurdishness to the fatal violence she was subjected to reveals deeper patterns of erasure that Kurds have experienced in modern Iran. So what is this pattern? The pattern is, is that Kurdish territory is militarized zone soon after this Islamic regime came into power. The economic and cultural suppression, 
securitization, assimilationist politics towards Kurdish language and culture. And then also while Kurds constitute 10% of the population, but close to 50% of political prisoners in Iran are Kurds. And in recent months, we see that most of, of, of the Kurdish uh, women activists, environmental activists, human rights act activists have been um, arrested. A teacher, a very well-known case is uh, Zara Mohammadi, who was recently uh, released from in prison, but she was in, in, in prison for several years because of traveling to villages and, and, and teaching Kurdish language. Zainab Jalani, Jalalian, uh, who was arrested in, in 2008, is still in, 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 in prison. And she is becoming a, a known as the longest uh, Kurdish, the, the longest woman serving political prison, uh, serve, serving prison in, in, in Iran. I wanna mention a couple of other names in order to tell you that what is the significance of, of these Kurdish people being arrested and, and, and in prison. It's very important that we remember Farzad Kamangar and then Shirin Alambuli. Farzad was a beloved teacher, journalist and activist that was arrested um, at the same time uh, with, with uh, Shirin Alamhuye, who was also a woman activist. Both of, of, of them were executed on May 9th, 2010. Now, Farzad Kamangar, Shirin Alamhuli, like Zara Mohammadi, like Z Zainab Jalalian, they were sympathizers and activists of the Party of Free Life of Kurdistan, Hejak, known uh, is the, as the acronym in, in Iran. Actually, the, the uh, slogan of women life freedom, Zhenjian Azadi, was the one that they were um, um, uh, using as, as part of, 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 of their uh, activism. And those who were in prison with Shirin, they remember that she wrote this slogan on the prison walls. And you know that the roots of, of, of the historical roots of, of, of this slogan is in, in the uh, PKK political party of, of, of Turkey. And, and uh, I'm sure that uh, um, other colleagues and, 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 and panelists here will, will give us a, a, a better and an, an expanded history of, of this slogan. I was Gina's age when the compulsory veiling was proclaimed. Participated in, in the March 8, 1979 protests, the first uh, March uh, event that was organized post-revolution in Iran. I was bitten and shoved out of the bus to protest this compulsory veiling. The revolution took me also to Roj Halat, the Kurdish region of Iran. Um, it was in the fall of 1979 that I entered this rugged land for the first time in my life. As I was growing up in Iran, the colonial, national, chauvinistic, and racist construction of the Kurds extolled Iranian national politics, cultural discourse, and consciousness. But the 1979 revolution interrupted the incongruity of Iranian Persian nationalism and restored the right of national minorities to self-determination and autonomy, albeit for a way too short period, but long enough for me to find myself in the early 1980s in the mountains of Avroj Halat and being among the first cadre of women Peshmergans, freedom fighters. Fall term of 2022 was supposed to be another term. It turned out differently though. Jinnah's family made the crime of the state public and the city of, of, of Saqaz and the entire Kurdistan rose up. Women life freedom was echoed nationally and inst instantly was reverberated around the world. The media images of Wang Yong, beautiful women and daring made me restless. 
I devoured every image on social media. One day in October, I caught myself scanning the crowd intensely in search of Leila, Sahar, Maryam, Ziba, Setare, or Tala of 40 years ago. They were all executed in the 80s. We were in the crowd. We were carrying signs demanding equality for women, down with imperialism, down with dictatorship, free political prisoners, bread, jobs, freedom. I was reliving the past in the present and was searching for myself in the crowd. This time, it was not only a call for freedom, death to or down with, it was also a call for life. Every day for months in the early 80s, thousands of us were on the streets defending equality, freedom, and democracy. Four decades later, a new generation is still demanding the same on the same streets. Revolt of women is not a novelty in Iran, neither is it is in the entire region. The images of young women battling security forces, dancing to burn the veils, or even their sheer presence on the streets in, in every protest songs, in short recorded videos, disrupted the image of so-called Muslim Iranian women. They look like us, exclaimed the student. I was asked, is what we see true? Women look so un-Islamic. This, this was me 40 years ago, I replied. I was the generation who wanted change to end the misery of millions of, the, the misery of, of life for millions of, of, of people. But we were robbed of that opportunity. Our naivete and idealism cost the lives of our comrades who were executed in the 80s or forced into exile in thousands. This generation of women reinstituted my and possibly our dignity and pride, a sense of, of, of pride. But the question remains for us to think through. Why this long history of women's struggle in Iran or the entire map, uh, region is so misconstrued. Why so much misinterpretation by Iranian, non-Iranian scholars, and more specifically by feminists around the, the agency and, and, and the revolutionary act of, of women in the region. Most of, of the so-called reconstructions and, and, and constructions although coming from, from different um, diverse and, and conflicting theoretical positions, arrive at the same conclusion. And, and I'll focus on, on Iran, that Iranians are constructed as inherently religious and, 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 and also Muslims that becomes their, their identity. And, and also they desire uh, it is there that a state, the Islamic state is, is, is their uh, choice and it is their state. Therefore, this Islamic order should be and could be reformed and, and become more moderate and has the potential of, of, of this um, uh, reform. Every creative act of women to resist and defy the gender apartheid regime has been analyzed as the relationship between agency subjectivity and, and hence the notion of Islamic feminism and are not directing at the totality of the structure of power. As an instance, often my Marxist feminist analysis has been deemed too, too state centrist and too structuralist with a proclivity to undermine the agency, subjectivity, autonomy, or power of other social actors. In the current theoretical privileging of self and fragmentary approach to self society, oppression, exploitation, and dehistoricization of identity, 
and dematerialization of culture, religion, I argue that these analyses disregard actually life and freedom in the slogan of women, life and freedom. And then also the continuous widespread revolt of women, student, workers, nation, nationalities against the Islamic regime over the four decades and continuing. So International Women's Day of 2023 is upon us. Let me end with a proposition moving forward. Jin Jian Azadi, Women Life Freedom, has sparked a global feminist revolutionary imagination. We should aim at deepening its theoretical and political ethos to finish the unfinished project of a feminist revolution. In the MENA region, this means that we should comprehend first that fundamentalism and imperialism do not form a contradiction. While in conflict, they remain on the same side in so far as they are in fact against the emancipation of women, against the idea of, of, of democracy, independence, freedom, human rights, and, 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 and specifically, secularism and the idea of, of socialism. Second, historically too, Islamic fundamentalism and Western capitalism have formed a symbiosis and not a contradiction. This means that the reduction of war, poverty, violence, neoliberal authoritarianism in, in the MENA region uh, is the, it's not the question of either fundamentalism or imperialism. This actually distorts a very class nature of, of the, um, all the revolts that it is happening in, in, in that region, and especially that it is led by women, youth, LGBT communities, and nationalities. And finally, a revolutionary feminist starting point is not and should not be the problem of identity, authenticity, indigeneity, or rhetorical decolonization. From a feminist revolutionary perspective, no aspect of social relations, culture, and, and formations of identities can be separated from the larger patriarchal, racist, capitalist, and imperialist structures of power. I started with the notion of rethinking revolution with women life freedom. But with the politically volatile situation in Iran, this chemical poisonous attack on high school girls, one thousands of them as early as, as this morning report, the exponential rise in unemployment, poverty, devaluation of currency and, and, and violence, and also the rise of exiled right-wing coalitions reaching out to the West in search of an alternative. I think that it is also urgent that we reappropriate women life freedom and truly turn it into a radical, liberatory, and unjust pl platform, not only for, for the region, but it is it has very important global implications. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mojab, for sharing your invaluable ideas, but also your lived experiences. Um, we have time for questions. So I just, uh, I repeat myself, just thank you uh, for sharing your invaluable ideas and, uh, and wonderful, well, your wonderful ideas and exper experiences, lived experiences. So, thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Um, any questions? In the chat, you can unmute yourself if you have a question, um, or we can have Paul read the question out loud. Right, so we have a couple of questions coming in, and apologies for my pronunciations of names. We have a question from Mustafa Najafi, and 
Mustafa writes, many thanks for sharing with us your insights and lived experiences. Where do you see, if at all, the structural and foundational dissimilarities between what you'd seen from the beginning of the women's movement and revolts in Iran and what you saw in 2022? Thank you. Okay, so, uh, well, thank you so much for, for, for this question. It is, it's very important. Uh, there are uh, differences and, and they, um, one is, is that the uh, level of uh, knowledge and experience and, and um, daring of, of, of young women, and especially that high school students are, are playing a major role in, in what is happening uh, currently. And, and that's why that this poisonous chemical attack that it is happening against high school students, it's a kind of, of, of the state's revenge. And, 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 and creating a more condition of, of, of fear. The other thing is, is the solidarity across the, the country that it is, uh, and, and especially the role that national minorities, Baluchs and, and, and the Kurds are, are playing in, in that. That level of, of, of solidarity, and then also the level of uh, the spread of, of the revolt outside of, of, of the major cities in, in our corner of, of, of the country that it is happening is very unique in, in the history of, of, of periodical revolts in, in the last 40 years. And, and also the, the, the political maturity that I'm, I'm seeing in, in terms of openly talking about LGBTQ's rights. And, and, and making sure that that level of, of inclusion is this happening. I'm not trying to uh, sort of, of depict a very rosy picture here. The contradictions are huge. Patriarchal relations is, is, is there. In the, the uh, misogynism of at the family level to the government level and, and within the, the school system is, is, is there. It is truly a uh, cultural revolution as well as social political revolution. And that's why that the complexity that we are dealing with is happening at, at all these uh, levels. But thank you for, for the question. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mujab. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yes, I can hear you. So uh, there, I can see two questions here. Uh, one goes, one is by Colette. What are some things we women in the West can do to help draw more attention to this uh, so that change can take place? I think that the um, solidarity, building solidarity um, is, is, is very important. And then also understanding that there are multiple voices and, and, and um, competing uh, political uh, tensions. And, and also uh, being able to build that, that solidarity across the uh, for for the region and across the region is 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 also very very important, but I think that the um, it is important to understand the multiplicity of of the the rise of the right and and the the left, but mostly the right wing wing exile political forces that are uh, uh, sort of demanding or, or trying to um, uh, organize and, and mobilize the, the Western government uh, intervention. This is not a feminist project. This is not the project that, that uh, radical forces and, 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 and majority of, of the people in Iran want. Enough is enough of, of the uh, reliance on, on, on the Western um, uh, intervention in, in terms of the rebuilding and, and reconstituting the, the, the um, a, um, actually women life and, and freedom uh, in, in Iran. Thank you so much. Um, another question by Danielle. Uh, you touched on religiosity and its tense relationship with gender expression and how that can and should be reimagined. When it comes to news consumption, we often find villainizations of non-Christian religions. 
how do you contextualize that tendency to villainize while doing our reimagining and keeping up with the news? Um, the, I mean, this is very important and a uh, debate, and uh, this is happening right now in in, in the context of of uh, even um, you know context of, of of Canada. And in terms of the how how do we balance on on talking about the demands and and and, and the rights of 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 the um, uh, Iranian women with the idea of of fighting Islamophobia. And I, I think that, uh, you know, this is not a new debate for, for feminists. Feminists have always been um, uh, challenged by how do you sort of, of, of talk about racism and, 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 and the violence and, uh, against women and, and uh, you know, um, looking at gender oppression, class oppression, racial oppression, and, and all of that. We have a strong body of, of, of knowledge and, and, and experience in order to be able to do that. The way to connect it is, is that to show the relationship between the rise of Chris, Christian fundamentalism imposing, for example, the abortion, the taking away the rights of women to their own body and, and, and sexuality, to exactly what the Islamic regime is, is doing. The Islamic regime is the patriarchal regime. It is a theocratic patriarchal regime. And, and, and therefore that patriarchy is, is they, it, it uses, it absorbs, subsumes the, the religion as, as part of, of its political act. This is happening in, in the context of, of the US right now in terms of, of, of the rise of, of right-wing Christian fundamentalism and, 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 and also the whole discussion on, on, on uh, abortion. I think that we actually, it gives us a lot to connect globally, understand this nature of this, what I call patriarchal, either secular or theocratic capitalist regimes that is really uh, suppressing and oppressing women. And, and this is where it, it, this is where we can come together and 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 uh, build that global uh, feminist um, agenda. I want to uh, end by by giving you an example that it was in in 2019, just before the the, the beginning of, of of the COVID, that a very important slogan and anthem came out of of, of Chile, I, I think, and and. It was the, the most important an anthem that unfortunately got lost with the, uh, everything else that was happening in, in the world. And that anthem for the first time women came out and it started to uh, point at the structure of powers, the state, the church, the family that is creating the condition of their suppression and exploitation. It became instantly a global anthem for women. It was performed in a parliament in, in Turkey. It was performed in, in all European streets and performed in many different languages, including Kurdish and, 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 and Persian on, on the streets. The reason that it took that level of, of, of attention, it is spoke to women that the patriarchal structures of power, being the church, the mosque, the state, the family, is functioning the same in, in terms of, of, of the creating the condition of suppression and exploitation for women globally. Thank you so much. Um, well, Kaylee is impressed by your journey, so she has an, a personal question for you. Uh, and this is the last question. Uh, how did you find the strength to keep going and keep doing what you did? A, a, a brush with, with change and, and, and revolution is a life-altering experience, and I, I cherish it. But also, you know, as I said, um, I'm living with the memory and, 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 and the wishes and the dreams of thousands of, of other women that didn't make it to this day to see this uprising now. And I feel that um, I'm obliged to um, 
follow my own dream. It's not a personal uh, agenda, but also a collective agenda. And uh, it's, it's, it's the most human response. And I, I, I cherish it and I, I love it. That gives me hope to move on. It's not easy. I'm not, I'm not sort of a, trying to uh, be idealistic about it. It is painful, it's difficult, but um, that's what it is. And that's part of this struggle. Thank you so much. We all appreciate your wonderful answers and the great talk. That was very illuminating. And thanks for joining us today. So uh, we're going to move on to our second speaker, uh, Dr. Uslem Gunner. The title of her talk is Iraqi Yet Unceasing Struggle, Kurdish Women's Path to Self-Organizing in Bakur. Dr. Gunnar is an associate professor at the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at the College of Staten Island and the Middle Eastern Studies at the Graduate Center of the City, University of New York. Her book entitled Turkish National Identity and Its Outsiders, Memories of State Violence in Dersin was published by Rutledge in June, 2017. She has written academic and popular journal articles on the themes of state violence, gendered memories, and anti-colonial resistance. She's a steering committee member of the Emergency Committee for Rojava. Thank you, Dr. Gunner, for joining us. Uh, we are ready for your talk. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And um, it's very nice to be in the same panel with Dr. Mojab here, um, you know, whom we've exchanged at the moment of the <laughs> uprisings when they first started there was intense excitement but also concern and trying to build solidarity and see what we could do because we should you know always remember or that I, at least I try to remember myself that we're in academic settings that's um we, we analyze we talk but most of most of the time there's a gap between what's happening and the real struggles on the streets and endangered lives and ongoing criminalization against movements and our own lives and the set of um discourses right that we um, assess and evaluate the ongoing struggles. So being involved in any level that one can be is the only motivation for those of us who are sincerely um, caring about the oppression, the oppressive struggles of the current systems and how to build a better world, how to build a world where we can imagine freedom, where we can imagine to be free. Um, so Dr. Mojab uh, already discussed many important things and especially the um, Kurdish oppression, the Kurdish colonial reality in Iran and um, kindly referred to the, the what uh, myself and Farangis um, Gaderi wrote about um, the erasure of Gina's Kurdishness and what that erasure means and that it's not, you know, just because many people, um, when it first erupted, let me start with a bit of personal um, um, feelings and how these things make us feel, right, at the time that when uh, Gina Amini, Gina Masa Amini was killed, um, those of us, Kurdish women, Kurdish scholars, Kurdish scholar activists, we started to writing to each other about why is it that only her Persian name is being um, referred to in texts and even in solidarity movements, texts that are trying to, that seem otherwise good. Like, what does this erasure mean? Why, you know, and even while referring to her or even while referring that she's from Sikhiz or she's uh, Kurdish, that there was the insistence on the uh, use of her Persian name. And so, it was challenging because for us to have witnessed this over and over again, the killing of Kurdish women are connected in our memories and they trigger um, not only certain emotional responses, 
but the need for a certain type of feminism, not just any feminism, right, but a certain um, type of feminism that could be internationalist, that could be intersectional, that could be anti-racist, anti-colonial, anti-capitalist simultaneously. Now, the reason for that particular type of feminism and why recognizing Gina's Kurdishness was critical to build towards that kind of feminist movement um, is they're very connected. And I, I'm gonna try to open up some of those connections because there are multiple questions on the table. And the reason I emphasize or we emphasized or this created emotional political responses among Kurdish activists wasn't only that, look, Kurds are more oppressed in Iran. There's this colonial reality and we need to explain it. We need to understand it. Not only about the oppression, suppression of uh, this ethnic minority and also their religious minority in Iran, um, not only that, but that if we if we don't recognize it, and most importantly, if we don't see where this chant of Jin Jian Azadi came from, if we don't recognize those, we are missing an important opportunity to build towards a feminist movement that's simultaneously anti-imperial and anti-colonial. So why, why is it important? I'm going to um, try to open some of that up by looking especially in the emergence of um, the Kurdish women's freedom movement in Bakur um, with the Workers' Party of Kurdistan that Professor Mirjab um, referred to and look at how um, women's question, women's um, women-centered political agenda, ideology, as well as institutionalization uh, became central in the Kurdish movement. And also it's very important, and I think, you know, we cherish this. It's not just a um, problematizing of the cultural appropriation. It's a moment that we cherish the echoing of Jinjian Azadi and its power, the power of these three words, women, life, freedom. And, and it, it says some about the power of the Kurdish women's movement um, and how recognizing it can really help us bridge some of these gaps between academia and activism, between, you know, um, obviously this big problem of Islamophobia and how not to play into it, but at the same time, how recognize the bottom-up resistance movements that are against the similar systems of oppression that are built upon state violence, capitalism, colonialism, racism, and many other, um, many other uh, systems of oppression. So the Kurdish freedom movement, even at its start, had to be intersectional. And this reminds me of for those of you who may be familiar with the um, Black Marxism, uh, is that it had to be necessarily intersectional. It emerged in the 1970s in Bakur, which is in the borders of colonial Turkey, it's occupied territories of Kurdistan under Turkey. And um, it, it came out of a Marxist-Leninist tradition, an anti-capitalist tradition, but came with a critique of some of those Marxist-Leninist um, movements that did not recognize the issue of colonialism in Turkey. Now, this is very important because the Marxist-Leninist movements of the time were very cognizant of the imperial reality. We're very critical of US imperialism in the region, but they didn't see the entanglements of Turkish capitalism with that imperial reality. And they didn't see how Turkish capitalism really acted along with that colonial on top of and along with side by side with that colonial oppression and exploitation of the Kurds and their lands. So initially in its emergence in the 1970s, this struggle had to pay attention to at least two components of oppression that were central, um, as that had to be central 
for creating a free world. And one of that was class and capitalism. And the other axes of that was colonialism. Now, I'm not saying, again, maybe, you know, terms are very important here because I'm not using the term ethnic minority or the oppression of Kurds as an ethnic minority, but I'm referring to as a colonial reality and how colonialism and capitalism in many parts of the world, because it also opens us to a more global reality that these um, axes of oppression work in tandem, work together. And so that's why in its emergence, this movement started with an intersectional angle without using um, the you know, modern usage of intersectionality, but obviously the showing the oppressions and axes of oppression working together, it originally had an intersectional approach, um, both to understanding oppression, state oppression, state violence, because it was never seeing state violence against Kurds only as a, a, as a political violence issue, but it always saw its capitalist entanglements. And so how that violence was necessary and inherent part of, of um, capitalist reality in the region. So, but then even in those very early starts in the 1970s, I'm going to refer to two figures. One of them is the leader of the Workers' Party of Kurdistan, Abdullah Öcalan. And if I don't have really a like a proper slideshow, but I just wanted to show some pictures if I can be enabled to share my screen. And if not, it's not a huge deal. It was just a couple of things. So I'll, you know, talk about um, Öcalan, the founder of the Workers' Party of Kurdistan. In the uh, late 1970s, he started to also write about um, uh, about women as the, you know, he didn't use the concept first colony then, he uses and reads Maria Mize and other Marxist feminists and then starts to more and more center um, patriarchy and patriarchal oppression as one of the major axes of oppression that needs to be fought against in order to create a free society. And that's also very important, I think, the notion of free society and the notion of azadi in all this, azadi, uh, freedom. So because it's not um, talking about injustice or inequality that can be otherwise, um, that can be gained in an otherwise, right, exploitative, oppressive society. It is a broader vision of how to live freely through getting rid of all systems of oppression simultaneously. So this, in the early part of Öcalan's thought, it started to show up, but it wasn't systematic. In the 1970s and early writings in the 1980s, um, the PKK early on, and it was, it's an important development still. I want to understand the importance or emphasize the importance of even this early um, adoption of the notion of patriarchy, gender roles, and his, uh, his concept of um, killing the dominant male um, being an important part of freedom. Um, and so let me see if I could share. Um, okay, let's see. Yes, there. So as we see, it, it, even as early as 1980s, he started to talk about killing the man, killing the dominant man. And here, his conversations, sometimes pragmatic, about how to involve women in this struggle of freedom. And again, some people interpret this as a nationalist movement, but my argument is that the PKK was never really necessarily a nationalist movement. It was a Marxist nationalist movement initially that had an anti-colonial um, approach. So even that initial phases of the emergence of the movement, um, Öcalan started to talk about his own family life and this notion of masculinity and what it means to be male, and how to really kill the man, kill the dominant man within a man. 
So, you know, it wasn't systematic in 19, um, late 1970s and early 80s, but it was there and it started to attract more and more women around the party. And one of the, the other important figure that I'm going to emphasize in this talk um, is Sakine Jansis, who was one of the founders of the PKK together with Öcalan. And she, um, her identity is very important to me, both personally and politically, because also not just to the Kurdish movement, but to understand her really gives us an angle as to what kind of feminism. Because Sakine Jansis um, for the movement is very important to develop, um, to make women's, um, to make patriarchy as a central axis of oppression that needs to be exterminated. And as early as 1970s, um, she starts to work in um, among uh, factory workers in different parts of Turkey to organize them, to mobilize them. So I like um, to emphasize that part because her struggle, right? Sometimes ideology can be, um, uh, sometimes ideologies are clear and people are in it, in a movement with this ideology, but other times your actual actions and struggles show what you were doing and what was central um, to your movement. And Sakine Jansuz's actions at the end of 1970s are very critical because she at the same time is uh, separating from the Turkish left and you know, getting in lots of arguments and fights about the colonial reality and how the Turkish left is unable to um, realize uh, Turkish colonialism and how it conditions Turkish capitalism so that you cannot fight against capitalism without this colonial question. Not only right at something else or at the issue of Kurdish minority, but really to see colonial and capitalist entities working hand in hand. So her work with the factory workers, along with this emphasis on anti-colonialism, but still uh, Marxist-Leninist angles of anti-capitalism and showing that the exploitative nature of um, of capitalism as early as that. And one other important parts of Sakine Jansuz's identity and her political education uh, that shapes the PKK, that shapes the Kurdish women's freedom movement later, is that she's from the region of Dersim, which is where I actually also am from. And, um, and this region is a very interesting region. Uh, it had um, Armenian, you know, even after the Armenian genocide, um, there was a huge Armenian population residing in this town. So in state reports, you know, when I wrote about the violence against Dersim, that in state reports, you see the problematization of this Armenian identity, Kurdish identity in the region. But these are also Kurds in Dersim speak a, a minority language called Zaza language, which is even minority among the Kurds. And she is also Alevi, majority of Kurds in Turkey are Sunni Muslims. And so she's Alevi, she's a religious minority, comes out of that and also emphasizes her grandmothers in her memoir, um, in the first volume of her memoir. She talks about her grandmother's um, stories of violence and massacres in Dersim. Now, some of you might not know this, but um, Kurds in the parts of um, uh, colonized lands that they lived in, occupied lands that they lived in, um, have faced multiple um, forms of state oppression and also very um, important genocidal projects at the hands of these colonizer states. So Dersim, for example, in 1938, which is where Sakine Jansas is from, um, has um, witnessed, has experienced series of genocidal massacres that um, resulted in the killing of tens of thousands at the hands of the state. And there is a very critical gendered dimension of this violence. You know, the adoption of the girls, the rape and sexual violence used against um, Kurdish women in this region um, was very influential in shaping her politics and her, her, her identity and her ideology. 
Um, and so she's very then bringing together this axis of Kurdish colonial reality, exploitation of factory workers, and also the minority among the minority of non-Muslims and Alevis, these religious minorities, and their memories of state violence have really shaped uh, her political identity. And she's one of the early founders of the Workers' Party of Kurdistan, and also one that worked very actively in organizing women um, and in gaining many, many, many um, thousands of you know, supporters for the PKK in the 1970s and later in 1980, when she was captured by the Turkish state, um, it, it was a very important foundational moment for the women's movement in the Workers' Party of Kurdistan to establish itself and to gain more recognition by the broader movement. So because this is a very important question that we need to understand here, is that how has a women's movement gained so much ideological, educational, institutional leverage, power, space, in a broader freedom movement. Because we've seen, you know, in many anti-colonial movements that in the region and elsewhere that women were sidelined afterwards or even during the revolution, their issues and the issue of patriarchy was hardly ever addressed. So the question here is how has the Kurdish women's movement developed um, such important ideology from education system to self-defense, to political parties, to co-chair and representation that we see today in the Kurdish freedom movement, how have they gained such force in the party? And that's why it's important to understand these different moments. And one of the important moments is the in 1980, the infamous Diyarbakir prisons, where um, Turkish states tortured um, Kurdish, I mean, all leftists, but especially um, the Kurdish anti-colonial uh, Marxist-Leninist party was especially targeted and the dehumanization that was used against them, there's been memoirs and documentaries about just the sheer force of dehumanization in those prisons. But Sakine Jansus gained this leverage for the women's movement in those prisons, in those same prisons where the Turkish state was using extreme sexual gendered violence against women, uh, you know, kind of using gendered notions and concepts of honor and trying to use them against the Kurdish women to break them, to turn them against the movement. But Jansus there in the early 1980s developed a very important um, important power for the women's movement by showing, by writing, first of all, there is a, a, you know, using today's terms, a very important evolutionist aspect, writing defenses with women, for women, in her defense, um, talking about um, the illegitimacy of law and illegitimacy of this colonial law, and giving defenses for on behalf of women and on behalf of exploited classes and colonized populations alike. So she brought these three angles of struggle together in her lifetime, a long time that she served and was tortured and dehumanized in the Arbuckle prisons in the 1980s. So um, this Öcalan's thought, and sometimes, you know, and uh, there is still more research, Dilar Dirik's uh, recent book on Kurdish uh, women's movement is very important, but more research also needs to be done to show how the leader Öcalan and the women who participated in this, John Sus, but many, many other women, because we see the increasing popularization, this dialectics of suppression, oppression, and resistance in the Kurdish movement and in the Kurdish women's movement more specifically. Because as the Turkish state used more violence against 
uh, Kurdish women, more sexual and gendered violence against Kurdish women, more women started to participate in the movement. So towards the end of 1980s, and then early 1990s, after the eruption of the war between the Turkish state and um, the Workers' Party of Kurdistan in 1984, they started a guerrilla warfare against the state, and the state started to criminalize all Kurdish lands at much more intensified heights. Uh, burning villages, displacing two millions of people during the 1990s. And again, dialectics of oppression, suppression, and resistance, more and more women joined the party in the 1990s. And so we see the 90s as this very important growth of women's movement and very important time period for the struggles and fights, because obviously uh, patriarchal dominant um, powers within the party were not ready to give in. And so there's actual fights and struggles and the Kurdish movement and the Kurdish women's movement within that start to organize uh, more and more. And at that point, we see Kurdish women as mothers of guerrillas, all so sectors as guerrillas, as mothers of guerrillas, as Saturday mothers, and they enter the parliament. So you have in the 1990s, this um, eruption of women in politics and in all aspects of political Kurdish political life, all aspects of life of the Kurdish political movement. And there are struggles. For example, we see um, Leila Zana. Um, giving a speech, a Kurdish speech at the Turkish parliament in 1991. And, you know, these important timelines that she was um, uh, the first person to speak Kurdish in the parliament. And it's not a coincidence, as Shahrazad Mujab earlier was putting, that many um, active uh, activists of the Kurdish movement in Rojilat are women, and they've been imprisoned for this activism in many parts of Kurdistan. But these came with struggles, also important gains. And for example, in 1995, KKK Women's Congress released a two-page statement, and in this uh, we can just shortly, if I can go over it, it, says the potential of women who make up half of the society in the service of the revolution and their hidden and suppressed talents and intelligence in creating an entire society based on equality is the most humane and the most radical characteristic of our revolution. Our movement deals with the question at the ideological, political, party, and military level, and has made great steps in all of these areas. So similarly, there's this back and forth between, you know, it's not just Öcalan as one leader shaping this women's movement. It is that he's given some opening, but then more women participating, discussing, debating, forming their institutions, organizations, demanding, fighting, struggling with the men who wanted to hold on to patriarchal power. And there was a back and forth between Öcalan and the women. Uh, and here we see, for example, in Öcalan's thought that this becomes more systematic as well. And for example, he, uh, in Liberating Life, talks about uh, especially the importance of women's party. And this is something, right, I say today, we need to pay attention to Kurdish movement, not only because Xinjiang Azadi originated in the Kurdish movement, and not only because Kurds started, you know, especially Kurdish regions were um, explicit targets of Iranian state violence, right? If others were, also poison gassed and beaten, Kurdish towns were bombed and people were killed on the streets. So not only because that there is extreme suppression and oppression against colonized Kurds, uh, but because there are many uh, 
decades of women's organizing for free life and society that has given way to this um, notion of women life freedom and that there's decades of struggle um, that we're going to be having right at the moment maybe with the revolution being so um, bright that men supporting being on the streets I think it's very important very powerful but that there will be times where there will be contradictions such as in the Kurdish movement there were times when there are contradictions for example this is Gultan Kshanak uh, who is currently in prison um, and she talks about in 2007 how men in Kurdish political movement accepted the number of women to be elected but they came out with a new offer to put famous women or wives of famous women uh, famous men onto the list and but we said no because the number itself wasn't going to be meaningful as long as the proper acknowledgement of women was not recognized by men and society so if you look at here, after long and harsh arguments, we won this battle. I think this is very critical to see that there is battles to be won within the movement, not just against the state, but within the movement. And therefore, it's important to see, to learn what it comes from and how there is an ongoing struggle for revolutionizing, ongoing struggle for freedom in the movement. And um, this movement in Bakur led to um, the Rojava revolution of 2012, where the chant of Xinjiang Azadi became institutionalized, I call it. Because there, there was a practice, okay, there's no longer the Syrian state, there's no longer the colonizer state, the movement can now, obviously under the attacks and ongoing wars at the hands of the Turkish state, but it has some space to try to build institutions of that um, democratic modernity, radical democracy, active participation of uh, all peoples and women in the governance of societies. So there we see these important um, developments such as um, in institutions of women's empowerment, women's parallel parties, um, co-chairship system, uh, women's asayish, which is alternative to policing, but at the same time, how can we, you know, these questions that are very important for movements today, right, like evolution, but how to build alternatives in place, anti-capitalist, anti-patriarchal societies, but how are we really going to express and try to live these freedoms in, by creating the institutions that will give us the space, that will give us the um, structure to really uh, to enjoy some of these freedoms that we ideologically fight for. And in here, we see the slogan, women, life, freedom in Rojava having come to life, though it's not complete, though it's a struggle. As you know, women I've spoken in the region, uh, one of them, for example, Foza Yusuf, said, we never say we're free. We're not. We're just trying to just stay on that path towards freedom by re revolutionizing ourselves and our societies every day. And so that Jin, women, Jian life, and that life also includes this important notion of ecology and nature and anti-capitalist practices where nature can really be enjoyed. And, um, and azadi, which is freedom, but freedom from capitalism, from oppression, from colonialism, from racism, from ableism, from heteronormativity, so to give us this space of imagination that's beyond capitalist modernity. And that's why we need to understand that that movement that has given rise to the chant 
of women life freedom that activated millions across the globe, millions of women, especially across the globe, has been criminalized on a daily basis. And I know I'm going over time, so I'm just going to end by saying in the same month that Gina Amini, Gina Masa Amini was killed in Iran, Nagihan Akarsan, an important member of the genealogy committee, which is you know, women's science and uh, liberation of the Kurdish freedom movement, Kurdish women's freedom movement, was assassinated in the borders of Iraq by the Turkish government. And that, and now again, Akarsa was important because she was really one of the founders of that chant, one of the early writers who used the meanings of women, life, freedom, and the fact that her criminalization, assassination of many, many, many Kurdish women like her in Rojava, in Iraq, the imprisonment of many that I've referred to here, Gülten Kışanak, Sakine Jansız, assassination of Sakine Jansız 10 years ago, that it is, it is most disheartening then to see, it's very, it, it, it's exciting to see that people adopt this and adopt it for different struggles, but it is disheartening to ignore the criminalization and assassination of the very women who struggled for the adoption, for the emergence, production, and, um, and, and institutionalization of this important chant, uh, Women, Life, Freedom, Jinjian Azadi. So I'm going to end there. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Aslam, for uh, expanding our knowledge on the Kurdish history uh, and context of uh, Jinjian Azadi. Uh, I can't see questions on chat. If others can see that, you can let me know. Megan, do you see any questions in chat? Can... Yes, if anyone has questions, we can take the phone to, uh, microphone to them. Anybody in the audience? Also, people uh, on chat, if you can ask to be unmuted if you prefer to ask your questions rather than typing it. Paul. Dr. Gono, can you hear me? Thank you very much. I'm in the room here in Dayton. Thank you so yes. much for your talk. You mentioned the dialectic of support subjection, oppression, and resistance, looking backwards at understanding this liberation movement. I don't know how legitimate it is to try to project forward based on the current protests and then the oppression that's happening now, but do you want to think dialectically a little bit forward for us at where do you think this movement is going? And that's a very open-ended question, but um, thank you. Thank you. I mean, yes, so you know, it, it is unfortunate. Obviously, it is saddening. It's it's very disheartening to see uh, regimes um, using such sheer violence against protesters, especially in the case of right Iran or Kurdish movement. I mean, these are very young protesters, um, as Shahrazad Mojab um, mentioned. It's the use of chemical gas against um, high school girls, right? So this is the extent of this violence. But I think historically, right, I can speak and maybe make a projection in this historically, um, the use of sheer violence has not stopped movements. Um, if if they are strong, if they are if they have the foundations, and if there is organization and education. So I think that's why I wanted to emphasize some of the elements that we need to be thinking about, right? In terms of creating solidarity movements, that we need to make our movement stronger. The reason that the Kurdish movement didn't die when millions of them were displaced 
when tens of thousands of them were killed is because there were very um, important foundations in it that the organizations, the knitting, the reaching out to people on an everyday basis was a lesson well learned. And so, and important organizations, institutions, even mechanisms of self-defense, right? Um, for and, and today they're being practiced on the streets of in Iran and elsewhere. People learn, right, in Gizi, in Turkey, this famous um, protest movements, um, that people learn how to protect themselves against tear gas. People learn how to support each other on the streets. So by these means um, and by strengthening uh, the moment, strengthening the revolutionary organizations, that they can resist and grow um, despite the violence of the state, despite the sheer violence of the great the state. Um, but it is not easy either to, to manage to accomplish all of these. And that is where I think um, international solidarity comes in. That's where uh, sharing, joining movements from bottom together, right? Learning from each other, teaching to each other um, becomes. So these tools, which tools are we mobilized? how on the ground we can support and how we can create solidarity here in the places from the spaces that we are at so that the movements can be strengthened and can um, can survive and, chair, and and even get stronger out of that sheer state violence. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that. It, it's a fascinating uh, uh, tour de force in um, in the Kurdish women's movement, and I learned a tremendous amount. So thank you so much for that. Um, what are the current mechanisms for solidarity between the the Kurdish women's movement and the broader Iranian movements around women, life, freedom, and then in that also beyond sort of Kurdish. Um, Iranian networks, the broader networks throughout Turkey, the region, and then globally. What is currently practically happening in terms of solidarity um, that you're noticing? Where do you think um, more needs to be done? And we we very much try and get into the practical methods of actually doing this work. Um, and I know you're an academic, but in any event, can you talk a little bit about how the mechanisms of that solidarity are currently working uh, throughout the sort of region and amongst women's rights activists? Yeah, yeah, thank you for that question. I think it's it's very important. I mean, that's one that I dearly care about. Um, and I think, um, you know, Shahrazad Mujab's the question that was raised about how can we stand in solidarity, but at the same time, avoid Islamophobia, right? Avoid the recreation of these, um, these imperial visions of the region. Um, and, and I think these, these, the answer to your question also gives us a key to that question of how do we avoid. Um, so in the Kurdish movement, there is um, a notion of people's diplomacy and reaching out from below. So how can we not interact at these levels of states, right? That has been oppressive and has been agents of capitalist exploitation, colonial racist violence and patriarchal violence and not engaging at those levels of states and state interests and their definitions of the other society, but at the level of the needs, urgencies of the bottom. And so I think in that sense, for example, Kurdish women's movement has been interacting with the indigenous movements of South America. They've done lots of work with, you know, um, the Chile and how, you know, that demands against the church, against state, against capitalist exploitation, that on the ground, our demands are shared 
And the reason they're shared is because the global exploitation, capitalist exploitation, it's not just imperialism, but also it is global capitalism where each state has its exploitative capitalist class that's, you know, oppressing the rest of the society. So sometimes I'm, I know I'm diverting a little bit from your question because it rings bell with so many other questions that in our activism, I'm just going to share that and this maybe will be more clear, that when we try to get more solidarity with Rojava, when people were killed both by ISIS and the Turkish state, still three people were killed two days ago, uh, three days ago in Rojava, three Yezidi people, ethnic minorities who worked against ISIS and worked for democratic confederalism, radical participatory democracy in their own societies, these Yezidi communities were killed. But when we try to look for solidarity, we hit walls. People call us, you know, acting with imperial powers. People call us, oh, that's like Western notions of feminism. It's freedom. People want freedom, want to live free lives. And the societies that we live in aren't what, you know, the imperial visions of us, imagine of us, as Shahrazad was saying. These are societies where there was, you know, strong social movements, Marxist-Leninist movements, Kurdish anti-colonial movement grew out of that. And we have it in every place. I mean, in the US, there is the Black socialists and other movements that are trying to carry the traditions of, right, like Black power movements of the 1970s. So what Kurdish movement tries to do is to work with movements on the ground that share same principles of intersectional, internationalist, anti-capitalist, anti-colonial, anti-patriarchal, um, uh, and, and, and more, right, against more old systems of oppression. So we try to get together with these movements that are on the ground. And if we build more and more connections, then we can be more powerful against um, the systems of oppression that act globally. Um, and, and that is then beyond the logics of states, right? Russia, China, and how, you know, and how these are all imperial powers <laughs> and all capitalist, global capitalist powers. And somehow we get into the state logic and put one against the other and take sides with states. That's not where our power is. Our power is with the movements that is below the state, that is bottom up from the ground and movements that we share values, ideologies, practices with, and we can, or we can develop and learn from one another and develop that, that um, anti-systemic internationalist um, solidarity movements. And it, it, so it's so long story short, it is happening. It's happening between movements, only like academics, sometimes we're, we're not, we're not seeing it because if, but if we are involved in the movements, we actually can see, like, I, I try to participate. I'm not just a, a scholar. I'm not just an academic. Actually, my academic head is much smaller and it's getting smaller each day. But if you are with the movement, see how you can support the movement, get in touch, and then you see that how globally linked they are. Thank you, Aslam. As you can see in the chat box, people are very appreciative of your beautiful analyses. Uh, well, Shahzad and Aslam, I can't thank you enough for these two impressive talks. Uh, I'm sure everybody's feeling the same. Uh, we have uh, our next panel is going to start at three, so we are going to take a break, a short break, and come back at three for the rest of our symposium. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aslam. Thank you, Shahrazad. Nice to listen to you always. <laughs>